And I want to welcome everybody to our latest presentation that we're doing in collaboration with um, Black River um, Action Team. And I'm not going to say very much. I'm Sue. I'm the library director here in, in Springfield. And I'm going to pass it off to Kelly, who's the head of our Black River um, Action Team here in town. Okay. Take it away, Kelly. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sue. It's really exciting to see everybody here. Um, so as Sue mentioned, I'm Kelly Stetner. I founded the Black River Action Team uh, based here in Springfield, but taking, taking a look at the entire watershed in Windsor County, uh, I started that about 2000, so looking at 20 years. Um, and over that time, it became clear to me that water quality is really tied to so many other things, including and actually especially the trees and other vegetation around the water. Um, that connection though, the, the clearer it becomes to me, it also becomes clear that it may not be as obvious to most other people. Um, so here tonight, thankfully, to talk to us about some of the many ways that rivers, healthy rivers really depend on healthy forests and how we can help out in that dynamic relationship. Um, I wanna welcome our county forester, Hannah Dallas. Thank you for coming, Hannah. Hi everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day and thanks for joining. Um, thank you to Kel and uh, thank you for the Springfield Library for hosting this. I'm glad everybody can make it. I am going to share my screen and um, open up my presentation. So let me get that. So here and see. Is everybody seeing the just the slideshow or is it like a slideshow present presentation platform? It looks like the platform to me. I can see your next slide is ready too. Yeah, I've had trouble with this. <laughs> let me get let me try to get it right. Um, let me try to share this. How about that? That looks good. Is it just the full presentation? That's what okay. I'm seeing is just the slide. Excellent. All right. So that's what we're going for. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, so we're talking about healthy forests. Um, and healthy rivers. I am the Southern Windsor County um, County Forester, so I cover um, about, I guess it's 13 towns in the southern portion of Windsor County. It's a very large county, so we've split it. Um, my northern counterpart is AJ Fallensby, and um, he covers kind of north of Woodstock um, area. So I, um, We'll dive in here. And um, I think, you know, most people are probably somewhat aware of invasives and the um, issues that they pose. So I won't go into too much detail about, um, you know, why we're concerned about invasives, but I did want to just um, kind of illustrate this continuum that sometimes can be confusing for people. We have on the left hand side, um, native plants that are, um, you know, commonly found and or used to be, you know, the only thing around and they've evolved with each other and they've been on the landscape for a long time. Um, then we have uh, naturalized plants, which are, you know, things like um, apples are a good example where they were brought here, they spread, but not, um, you know, not at a risky level. They kind of have adapted to the climate. They've been here for a very long time. There's something we call naturalized. Then we have non-native um, plants that, you know, similar to naturalized things, they are not you know, they're not native, but they also don't pose this huge risk. They don't seem to spread. They're usually, you know, it might get planted. It, it does fine where it's planted, but it doesn't spread outside of that. Um, then we have native invasives, 
which are things um, like um, some of our ferns or um, white-tailed deer sometimes are put in that category or American beech are also put in this category where um, they are native to the landscape, but they are not interacting in a way that is, um, you know, balanced with the things around them. So something has kind of um, tipped the scales and they're not, um, you know, they're not acting in a balanced way and they can be an issue, something that as a forester I talk about, you know, controlling um, maybe deer browse pressure on your property or um, beach sprouts that are you know, not, not allowing other things to grow. And then on the very end, on the right hand side, we have non-native invasive plants. And so, the, and I guess I should clarify tonight, I'm mostly, even though I mentioned deer, I'm mostly, we're, I'm just talking about uh, plants. So anytime I say invasives, I'm talking about invasive plants, um, terrestrial invasive plants, um, not any of the water um, species specifically, because those are things where we move out of the forested landscape and into the water directly. So then, so on the end, we have non-native invasive and that's invasive plants. And those are the things that, um, you know, I'm really concerned about. We here are concerned about um, and impact the, the health of our forest. And we're trying to make that connection for everybody that they also really impact the health of our streams and water quality. And so these plants, you know, most of them were brought here um, intentionally by, um, by landowners and by landscapers because they're pretty in some way or they um, create a really dense hedge and maybe they were used in kind of natural fence scenarios. And so um, that's what we're talking about tonight. And these plants, you know, they have longer photosynthesizing periods, so you will see them starting to leaf out very soon. Um, they are the first thing to leaf out in spring a lot of times, even before spring ephemerals sometimes. Um, they have no natural com uh, competition or predators because they didn't evolve on this landscape. And so there were other things that evolved with them to eat them or, or compete with them. A lot of them have aleopathic capabilities. And so that means that they are changing the soil chemistry um, by releasing toxins and other things in their roots or through their leaf litter. Um, a lot of them are also um, generalist. And so you can find them on lots of different um, places on the landscape. They might be in really wet um, wetlands and they might be in really dry sandy soils and they might be everywhere in between because they do really well on lots of sites. Um, and then they also, most of them have really prolific reproduction. So that might mean stump sprouts, it might mean seeds, um, you know, it might mean that they have, you know, something like knotweed has like five different modes of reproduction. And so they might break off really easy and then that one piece of plant might start a whole nother colony. And so that's, you know, why they're so worrisome is that they, they have such a, um, you know, this list, it's all things that scare us um, when we're trying to manage plant populations. Why should we care? Uh, why should the community at large care? Um, you know, the overarching reason, I would say, is that they decrease the resiliency of our forests and our streams. Um, they, you know, the more we have monocultures of anything, the less um, they can buffer the effects of climate change or of severe weather. Um, really, they, the less they can buffer anything that comes at them. They also um, harbor a lot of ticks and that's concerning from a human health standpoint or pet standpoint. They change the soil chemistry and so that was some of that aleopathic um, tendency. So they change the chemistry and then native plants just can't even get started. Even once you remove the invasives, it can be really hard for invasives to colonize that area again. They decrease the soil stability because the root systems are much different than native plants 
And so they are often shallow. They also um, have a tendency to break really easily and start new plants. That's one of their modes of reproduction. And so anything that breaks off really easy isn't holding the soil. Um, and so they can be really, you know, really detrimental along streams where once the bank was, you know, buffered by the um, ice melts in the spring and heavy flooding, now um, where invasives are, every time the water rises and falls and ice scours those banks, it's taking and moving a lot of soil with it, um, which is, you know, concerning for a lot of reasons, but specifically for stream health. You know, anytime you have an input of sediment into the stream, it's concerning for um, you know, fish breeding and anything that needs um, dissolved oxygen in the water. And it also, you know, just continues to scour and scour and scour and create problems. It also, you know, has in, uh, invasives also have a huge impact on wildlife health. And so, you know, when we're talking about birds, and eating the berries that can be a diuretic for a lot of birds and so they spend their energy eating these berries that don't uh, really give them any gain. It can change the plumage of birds and so their breeding is impacted. It uh, reduces biodiversity so that's you know both in the forest and in the streams um, and so things like uh, sorry just Things like uh, knotweed leaf litter, when it falls into the stream, the organisms that eat that leaf litter are not, um, you know, the things that are there naturally eating leaf litter are very diverse. But when you start only giving them basically junk food and, and leaf litter that um, doesn't sustain them through the winter and for a very long time, then it's like giving them candy. And so they can't um, you know, the biodiversity decreases because you're not feeding this, the things in the stream that all those organisms and that trickles, you know, trickles down, trickles up, um, the fish will, will change and, and all sorts of things. It also, you know, in a forest, it reduces the biodiversity of the understory species, which is again, concerning for the same reasons, things, these are, very complex systems. And so anytime something changes and becomes a monoculture, um, you really have to worry about what is losing out. And then, um, yeah, it changes the habitat structure. As you start to change all these pieces of the chain, the whole thing can start to fall apart. And so why does you know, why does BRAT and why does FPR, I work for Forest Parks and Recreation, so that's FPR, why do we care? Um, you know, riparian buffers are vital to water quality. And so I'm concerned about the forest, I'm concerned about water quality and the whole um, forested ecosystem. You can't really pull out the streams from the forest, they're all, you know, interconnected. Riparian areas are also at a really high risk for colonization by invasive species. And so, you know, that's why we focus on some of these riparian areas. They tend to move invasives. Um, I have a few slides later on, but it's really easy for invasives to move into very rural areas um, and remote areas through stream corridors because they, you know, the plant breaks off in the water and then travels downstream. And so it can be really hard to, um, to monitor for these things and, and watch out for, for changes in, in uh, invasive populations. And then, you know, when invasives take over riparian areas, they destabilize the banks, they disturb the chemical and nutrient balances, and that, you know, just disrupts the whole system. And uh, yeah, and also, sorry, and then invasives, they also spread from riparian corridors into the forest. And so the stream may bring it deeper into the forest, and then from the forest, and from the stream banks, it moves out into the forest. They can always also move back in. Yes, Kelly. Um, just for, for one of the uh, folks in the chat, would you be able to um, define riparian? Sure, absolutely, no problem. So riparian, I'm sorry, I had a note to also do that. Um, so riparian area is the, uh, the area that is a, you know, if you in a natural landscape, what we have is, 
you know, forest, um, and then there is a stream, and and then more forest on on the side. So it's not always what we see um, where we have development. A lot of times, it's you know, houses on either side of the stream, but. Um, but the riparian, the riparian corridor, riparian buffer is the area of forest adjacent to the stream. And so that's the, um, you know, the trees and the shrubs and, and herbaceous plants that are found, you know, within the, um, within the stream banks. And that can vary depending on who you talk to. When we consider the riparian area for um, FPR when we're considering forest management. We're looking at the closest 50 feet on either side of the stream, but you know other people look at the you know closest 100 feet. It can really, that buffer can vary, um, but it also varies and is informed by how much that stream is flooding and moving within the um, floodplain area. And so that can also inform how large you're looking at for the for the riparian area. Kelly, is that, you want to add anything? No, I think that's good. I guess I, I know um, after after a while I start thinking in jargon and I need to, <laughs> I need to remember that uh, not everybody has spent 20 years <laughs> doing a river team. So, so yeah, the, uh, the, the riparian area is basically all the, the vegetation on the banks of the, uh, of the stream or river, but as Hannah said, that the width of that area varies depending on what what you're specifically looking at. If you're looking at, um, you know, flood control, that's that could be anywhere from 50 to 100 feet. If you're looking at wood turtle habitat, that could be 300 feet. Um, so basically, it's all the vegetation on the stream banks, with with caveats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I would also say that. You know, a lot of times we're talking about the absence of a riparian buffer or corridor where there is development or maybe farmland that goes right up to the edge. And we're looking to, um, you know, in recruit a new buffer. And so that can take some time. It can take planting. Um, it's not always present, but we're always kind of looking at the best um, you know, ideal situation for that stream. And Kelly and um, Hannah, there's a question. Will you discuss Japanese knotweed? Yes. Yep. So uh, this slide is actually my first slide um, of some invasives and, or I guess it's not, I had a, a, some at the beginning, but this um, has several small plants of, um, of knotweed in it. And this is along a stream corridor. This is, in, this is on the um, Green River down in Guilford. Um, so not, not right in the backyard, but um, close. And so these are all little baby knotweeds that are present on this disturbed site. That's the little green sprouts coming up, right? Yes, yep. So all of the green um, in this picture are baby knotweeds. Um, and this site was, uh, it was disturbed by, I can't, I think it was a, a large storm event that came through. And um, this might have been part of a project that was post Irene, and then there was some work done, and then these spread after that work was done. I think that what it was. Um, and so, you know, this is, the water is not too far off the edge of this picture, and you can see how many knotweeds have, have sprung up. I'll go to the next site. This is another picture along the Connecticut River, and everything you can see here is invasive. And so this is just a few pictures to illustrate, um, you know, how at risk our riparian buffers are because they're frequently disturbed just by the nature of um, water moving in the streams and, and changing due to seasonality or due to, due to um, you know, rain events. And so that disturbance and the water carrying things like invasive seeds and, and 
plant part really puts these areas at risk. You can see on the other side of the Connecticut River and far like in the distance of this picture, um, that is also all invasive. And here's another one. Um, it's a little hard to see, but this was a pretty remote area in, um, in Marlborough. And all of the shoots, um, you can kind of see them best in the right hand picture. All of these shoots are um, glossy buckthorn. And so it, you know, it's, it's, pretty sad to see sometimes you know, that the vegetation around these streams was exactly what it should be. It had a great buffer along the stream, but then these invasives had come in. Um, and so I was here to map this and get some control work done on this before it really took off. They're all pretty small plants. Um, and so that was, that was the reason I was there this day um, was to kind of assess what was going on here. So I'm going to move into uh, the next portion of the presentation where I'm going to go through some of the common invasive plants. Um, and I, I was going to put them all into these slides and I decided that rather than doing that, I would put some links so that you later, when I, I can send out this presentation. You can, you can follow this link and explore more on your own. Um, and I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel. So I am going to try to transition smoothly to the VT Invasives website, which is our state run um, website for invasive plants that has, you know, just such a, a library full of invasives. Let me try to move over. And get here. Okay. I think, Kelly, can you verify? Okay. So this website, this is the Vermont Invasives website. I'm looking at the gallery of terrestrial plants. And I figured we'd go through some of these common ones. So you can just click on them um, and it will show you. Now I gotta move this. Um, it will show you some pictures of the invasives. It has lots of great pictures. You can click through um, pictures of the leaves. And there's also um, oftentimes pictures of um, natives, although this one, let's see, identification. So you can, you can download a fact sheet. It will give you some information on the plant. Um, there's biology. And so this is a piece I'll talk about um, later and, and want people to be paying attention, this biology portion. And some management options, which I will cover some of, but again, this has a lot of great information where they pulled it together. Um, the Vermont distribution. So there's a link to iNaturalist, which I'll have Kelly briefly go over in, in a couple slides, how you can help and citations. And so let me back up and go to, um, you know, I don't wanna spend a ton of time painstakingly going through all these invasives, but I do wanna touch on a few that are commonly found on um, in our riparian corridors. So um, let's see, I'm gonna get to glossy buckthorn here, which is one that I see that was one in that snowy picture. It's one I see a lot along um, riparian corridors. It's one I see, especially in wetlands. It, it does really well in wetlands and it is, um, you know, they have some different leaf shapes. Lots of different pictures. Pictures of the bark. And so you can um, read through these. 
It has dark green leaves. Um, it has, you know, dark berries. The berries start out as like a, a whitish and they turn throughout the season to a, a dark, dark purple. That's those, those berries there. It's um, a shrub. So a lot of times you'll start to see it when it is like knee high, there be lots of shoots and then it will start to get head high and then over your head. Um, and it can oftentimes be mistaken for um, alder. So it, you know, at a distance, you might think that it's native um, red alder. And, uh, and then you get up close and you realize it's actually just a sea of buckthorn. Let's see. Pond reed agmites is another one that we see a lot along stream corridors and in wetlands. Um, it's also known as um, canary grass. Some people call it canary grass, even though there's actually another canary grass. Um, it, you know, was brought because it has this large plumage at the top, um, but once it's in a wetland, it will just completely take over. It's also, you know, will punch through pavement and and um, can be, you know, uh, can be detrimental for more than just, you know, stream quality and water quality, but also for, you know, road crews and, and people that are trying to deal with infrastructure. So this again, it goes through the appearance and height. Um, it's very tall, 15 feet tall. It has these large, uh, large leaves, these plumage um, on the top, and you'll just see it, you know, you might see one or two one year and it just will keep spreading rapidly year after year. Go to, um, let's see. Honeysuckle is another one that is often all along stream corridors and riparian areas. And so you'll see there's honeysuckles with red, um, red berries and also honeysuckles with orange berries. They are quite large. They, again, they all start out small, but they, you'll see if you monitor these things year after year, they will get excuse me, large very fast. And, uh, and this one is one that has a native um, kind of look-alike. There is a native honeysuckle, but the native one, you know, is only found um, in in pretty you know remote areas. You're not going to commonly find it on stream banks, although it used to be there more often. But it's frequently outcompeted by invasive honeysuckle, and the um, I have a, a side by side, and again, in a few slides, I'm sorry to keep saying that, um, but I have a side by side of the uh, native versus uh, non native honeysuckle, and there are several differences. But if you're interested, I'll, I'll get into how to identify natives versus non natives in just a moment. So I think somebody asked for knotweed. There's um, there we go. So knotweed is one that a lot of people are pretty familiar with because it started to really take over um, a lot of riparian areas, especially after Irene. So it will reproduce in uh, different ways. So that, let me try to remember all of them, but it's um, the seed, the, um, the pieces of the plant, pieces of the, the rhizome, the root. Um, now I'm only coming up with three. Uh, I'm gonna have to get back to anybody that's really curious about that one, but the, it has five different modes of reproduction or, or splitting off. And um, this stuff is pretty tenacious. And so if you're, um, anywhere near a stream, chances are you're going to find some of this. Um, this website also has 
some great videos of it. Um, and this one is a real concern because it creates these dense, dense monocultures along the stream and it shades out anything else that's there. Um, it also impacts a lot of different habitats. So um, wood turtles that are trying to move through these areas have a really hard time moving through because um, the stems, you know, year after year also collapse. So it makes a really dense kind of carpet of dead, um, dead stems in there. The leaf litter is really um, pretty junky for all the um, things in streams that are, are trying to eat leaf litter and survive. Um, there's most of the organisms, small organisms in the streams are eating leaf litter and breaking that down. And knotweed just breaks down really quickly and it doesn't have the same nutritional value as something like a hardwood leaf, like a maple leaf or, um, you know, any, anything else that would naturally be along the stream. We get back to this list. Um, Kel, is there any specifically that you would like me to cover or should we leave people to explore on their own? Um, I think I think you pretty much, I, I, I always have my own list of like the dirty dozen that I'd love to, to touch on. Yeah. But I think a lot of folks are very in, interested in some of your management techniques. Um, okay, that's whether you Whether you kill and, and leave on site or you, I mean, so, it's more of a labor of love than it is just a war on weeds, go out and kill at once. It's definitely yeah. a, an ongoing management concept. I, I think I think folks would like to get into that and, and explore this sure. on their own. This is a great resource. Yeah, so I'm happy to do that. I didn't want to um, I didn't want to skip over it completely, but I just want to yeah, introduce people to the site. It's really, really great and you can explore. I've also so let me try and get back to my um, there, my screen sharing and get back to the presentation. Uh, hopefully, did that do it? Did you get, oh, let's see. And that, are we there? Let's see, I'm sorry. <laughs> A little bit. You're doing better than I, I do with these things. Ooh. All right, I want to get to this. Let's see. And you're probably seeing my. Seeing the common invasive plants with the QR code. Okay. Is it the, the full presentation or the. It's just the slide. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Okay. I can't tell on my end what exactly you guys are seeing. So. Um, we move on. So there, for anybody that wants to explore on their own but wants to have a little bit of guidance, I would suggest going through this list. And again, I'm happy to provide anybody with the PowerPoint. And so this um, list of invasives that I've put on this slide are ones that are common um, along riparian areas. And so there are, you know, you saw how many are on the VP Invasives website. Those are present in Vermont, but this list is really ones that are present that I'm seeing around our rivers in, um, you know, in Southern Windsor County. So I won't, won't linger here too long. Um, and so how to, you know, for anybody that's wondering how do I identify natives versus invasives, you know, you don't want to get rid of Eskel. No, I'm just, uh, Zadaya had made a, a comment in the chat uh, that, at least on her screen, she can't see the whole thing, that the slide is a little bigger than the screen. I don't know if you can adjust your scale at all. I'm, I'm not seeing that problem on mine, but I have an older laptop and who knows. Yeah, let me see. I don't know that I can change that because I'm not sure what it is. So I apologize. And um, this will be recorded, Zadaya, or it's being recorded. So um, Sue will send the link out 
um, later. And also the slideshow will be coming as a separate uh, series of, of slides. So you can certainly, um, oh yeah, signing off and signing back in might do the trick. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, so natives versus invasives, um, you know, the easiest way to learn is to find somebody who is a, a botany hobbyist, um, somebody that really enjoys doing this and has kind of maybe found somebody already, had a, had a parent, a grandparent that taught them some and has built off of that. So it's really, um, you know, really helpful to have a buddy to send maybe text pictures to or, or email pictures to. Um, iNaturalist, tell I, if you want to jump in and explain a little bit about iNaturalist, that'd be great. Sure, um, I'm, I'm somewhat of a anti-technology Luddite myself, so I can actually use iNaturalist and not freak out. So I, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's, I believe it's iNaturalist.org and you join up, create a free account, and I take pictures with my camera because I have a stupid phone, not a smartphone. So I take pictures with my camera, and then when I get home at night, I plug in my, uh, I, I plug it into my computer basically, and I can upload the photos that I took of a plant, a type of turtle, or you know, an organism. I'm not sure what it was, some kind of a fungus or something. And I, I put it in there. I put in where I saw it, and you know, to the best of my knowledge, it's a bird. And then pe people who have a whole lot more knowledge than I do log in, sift through, see if they can do a better job of identifying it more finely. Oh, that's a red-winged blackbird. Um, and then you know, they'll get other experts to log in and agree or have a conversation and refine the identification. But then you've actually learned what you found and it puts, puts it on a point on a map on the website and uh, researchers are able to use it. The state of Vermont is able to use it. Um, and it, it's, it's got a lot of applications. You can, we, we use it as a tool uh, for dragonflies to start looking at where we're seeing dragonfly larvae and um, the types of habitat that those larvae are, are being seen at. So there, there's a lot of different applications. I highly recommend iNaturalist. You can also shop on there and say, okay, where are we seeing buckthorn? Where could I go and, and figure out what a buckthorn looks like? Oh, it's right down the road. I should go check that out. Thank you. Yeah, um, so a great tool. It's kind of like your own um, pool of friends who are botany hobbyists or um, actual botanists and they can help you out. And then I also want to put a little plug in here. I think once um, we have warmer weather and as COVID things start to, you know, open up a little bit, um, we can do a spring plant ID walk for anybody that's interested in the, you know, Springfield area. I'm happy to do that. Um, I think it is really valuable to get out and actually see these things um, and try to try to figure out where they are on the landscape. So watch for that. And anybody that's interested in that, you know, send me an email, send Kelly an email. Um, we can keep track of that and put a list together. So I have a few favorite um, native plant ID books also that, you know, it doesn't, they don't identify the invasive. So if you're looking at an invasive, you might not get anywhere with these guides, but they can really help you um, understand what invasive, what the native plants are out there. And then when you see something that doesn't fit or you can't find in the guide, um, it might be a key that it is an invasive. So Newcomb's Wildflower Guide um, is a great one. I use it all the time. And then I really have loved the shrubs and vines of Vermont, which is all um, native shrubs and vines and, and gets you really familiar with what's supposed to be on the landscape. And, uh, and then you can suss out from there what's not supposed to be. And then I have also had, I also have these um, four websites that I go to quite often. VP Invasives is this one um, for identification of invasives. Um, and then using Go Botany. And each of these, um, if anybody isn't familiar with these, these are QR codes. You point your um, phone at them. It will link you to a website. And so, you know, here's the link to the website, but if you are tech savvy and 
want to um, maybe take these on your phone with you when you go out in the field, feel free to do that. Uh, so Go Botany has a whole list of native plants. Um, U.S. wildflowers is also really, um, it can be a little intimidating getting through this website, but also really good. Um, and wildflowers.org is another great one. So I use these all the time also for spring ephemerals, if anybody's interested. I see something that I haven't seen before or I've forgotten since last season. And these are um, four great websites for that. And here's, a, as promised, the picture of the native honeysuckle versus the invasive honeysuckle. And you can just see how different they are on the landscape. Um, you know, the native honeysuckle really, well, this is the easiest way I like to describe it, but, um, you know, it's, it's pretty shy on the landscape. It's in the forest. Invasive honeysuckle, it will just, take over and it's in your face and it grows way above your head. Um, the native suckle, native honeysuckle is never, um, you know, never above your knee. And so these are just two I, I thought I'd throw in there since I had the pictures of them to just show you examples of what invasive, invasive plants really look like. They're, they're big and loud and they don't look like they belong. All right, so moving on to addressing, you know, addressing this issue on private property. Most of Vermont is privately owned. Most of New England is privately owned. And so, um, you know, we're really appealing to people that this, um, if we want healthy rivers and streams and healthy forests, it does really fall on the shoulders of private landowners. And so the first step, um, you know, for, for managing invasives is taking notice of what you have. Um, if you're a landowner or if you frequently walk a uh, property, maybe you, you work with your neighbor to do some management or you both have identified that you want to do some invasive plant management, you know, take notice of what you have. And so um, use some, some flagging, that's some they have biodegradable flagging. There's also plastic flagging. It comes in lots of different colors and just start to mark as you're out there on the landscape, um, what are invasives and what are other plants of importance. So you might have two different color flaggings or, or more than that, flag invasive plants um, and flag those things that maybe you want to protect as you're looking at the invasives or looking at managing the invasives. And then, you know, once you're kind of done your, your brief assessment of what's out there, what do you have, you can start to make a plan. Um, and, you know, it's easy to quickly get discouraged if you, if your plan is to just pull all the invasives. Pulling is, um, very time consuming, very labor intensive. And, um, you know, you don't want to, you also don't want to just dive in and start to pull and look up and realize that you're never going to get anywhere um, pulling. If you spend, spend a whole year pulling and then realize that it's never going to get you anywhere, you, um, you haven't wasted a year, but you could be, you know, spending that time better assessing your, your plan of attack. And so, yeah, you really want to know the scope of what you're dealing with. And that's part of that inventory and planning in the beginning. Um, and knowing what you have and where it is can help you make informed decisions about control strategies. And so, um, you know, pulling invasives in a wet area where the, the soil is pretty seepy or in the spring can be much easier. But if you start to get into rocky, ledgy outcroppings or um, you start to get larger um, invasives of the same species, you might not be able to pull those. Or you might be looking at um, getting a chainsaw out or getting a brush saw out, something to control those. And so knowing what you have before you dive in is really helpful. And then I'll, I want to emphasize this over and over again. Um, 
controlling invasives is really all about knowing the plant's physiology and biology. And so there are some, yes, Cal. I'm sorry, just when you were mentioning um, pulling in a nice soft wet soil versus a more rocky scenario, I just made me think about the black swallow wart down here on the Black River. I actually found some growing out of a tiny little clot of dirt wedged in between some boulders and I thought, oh, I'm going to pull it and I pulled it and of course all of the to, uh, all of the aerial parts came off and all the root was left right there in the rock. So right to your next point, it's all about knowing your plant. Yeah, so, you know, it can be um, really frustrating if you spend a lot of time pulling something and then the roots just are there and regrow. Um, but there are other things that can, you know, pull really easily. There's, um, you know, knowing how that plant grows. And so, Things like knotweed, you're never going to be able to pull knotweed. The knotweed plant has um, a long tuber and root system. It, it, the stem is hollow and will break off very easily if you pull at it. And so that's never, um, you know, knowing that when you approach the plant, that that's never an option is, you know, really helpful in making a plan about how to control something. Uh, knotweed, you know, also, I guess for knotweed and for several other things, um, knowing the timing of the year to best control them, especially with herbicide. When a plant is, um, you know, leafing out in the spring, it's not going to absorb an herbicide that you put on the plant as it's pushing all of its resources, you know, upwards and into new growth. If you spray that with an herbicide, it's not going to be nearly as effective is if you wait until the you know summer and fall when it starts to draw the resources and carbohydrates back down into its root system. And so that's when you start to apply an herbicide. That's when you apply an herbicide if that's the mode you're going to use because it's drawing it into the root and using an herbicide that's really the point of using an herbicide is to kill the root system because some of these invasives you're never going to get anywhere with, um, unless you get at the root system, because they just have such a network of, of roots or the way the roots hold the carbohydrates like a knotweed um, can just be really, really, um, you know, fruitless if you, if you aren't targeting the, the way the plant grows. All right, let me just make sure. I am, yes. So these next two slides are an example of knotweed treatment. So in this picture, um, you can see there's a little bit of flagging and this area was treated with an herbicide. Um, the stream is not too far away um, and it's treated in the fall. You can see the rest of the leaves in this picture are starting to you know, fall off the trees. It was fall time. And so that knotweed was drawing drawing the herbicide down into the roots and it was a very successful treatment. In this, uh, sorry, Kyle, just a second. In this next one, um, this is a place where the herbicide was not treated first. They wanted to do a planting to replace the invasives, which is a great thing to do. And we'll talk about it in another slide. But what they did here first was they disturbed all the soil. They mixed it up in preparation for this planting and then they, um, you know, created hundreds and hundreds of little uh, knotweed rhizomes that, that created foliage, you know, they sprouted, but that foliage isn't, um, it doesn't have enough leaf surface to then treat the knotweed. So you can't pull it because it's just in all these little pieces. Um, and it's not big enough to, to actually control at this point. If they had treated it controlled it first and then disturbed the soil, it would have worked. But in this case, they you know, disturbed it, made a, made a whole mess, made hundreds of tiny baby knotweed plants. And now they have to actually wait for the knotweed to grow a couple years, put on enough leaf surface so that you can treat the leaf surface and then have it absorb it. So it's just, you know, it can be very frustrating if, if you don't know how the plant um, functions or you don't, you know, follow the right order of operation. Kelly? Yeah, I was just going to ask if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit. I know we're talking about private property uh, treatments, but if you would talk a little bit, or maybe you're going to, I'm sorry if I'm jumping the gun, um, about 
herbicide application close to streams? Yep, I'm, I will get there. Yeah, so this is a little bit of um, yeah, foreshadowing where I'm headed. So that's the, the next, next slide is actually invasive plant control, you know, chemical and non-chemical strategies. So um, I'll start, most people are, you know, mo curious about non-chemical strategies. Um, they seem to be kind of the, they're more elusive of the two. Um, just a second. And so non-chemical strategies, um, you know, these are things like mowing, um, that can include like with a tractor or, um, you know, with animals, I would consider that a mowing or grazing. It can mean kind of clipping with um, hand pruners or something. You can also do something like smothering with tarps or, um, or there's kind of smothering hybrid methods where you lay a mesh down for some invasive. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and it can also mean, you know, pulling. There are kind of other, there can be some burning, but that's generally not going to work in riparian areas because it's just never wet enough to get a fire going um, to, to kill the, the root crown. But um, these are kind of your basic non-chemical strategies. And so, um, so they are, you know, they are tricky. And again and again, I think it's important to understand the, um, the physiology of the plant that you're trying to control and what's going to work. If you're doing um, something like uh, mowing of a plant um, like uh, buckthorn, it is going to re-sprout with more and more vigor every time you mow that down. And it can be really, really difficult to actually exhaust its root source. It's like um, it's in the same family as apple um, or uh, any lots of different fruit trees. And um, you know that when you cut these fruit trees, they respond with water sprouts and they sprout vigorously. And that's just their natural response. And so every time you cut a buckthorn, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to multiply and it's going to you know add to its its um, root mass and it's not going to, you're not going to get far with, with mowing down buckthorn. Um, and the same with, with clipping it, it's pretty difficult. You sometimes can get somewhere with smothering it or pulling it. But again, these are, um, you know, I, I will get to the chemical side of it, although I keep, you know, alluding to it, but a lot of these you know, are often used in combination with a chemical control. And so it depends on how big your infestation is. But a lot of times, um, most professionals agree that you, if you have a large population, it is somehow knocking it back with the chemical control to then be able to come in and do, do these non-chemical strategies. Um, if you're starting with a small population, these are definitely possible. And so pulling out things like honeysuckle, um, especially in a wet area is definitely possible, but it also means um, a lot of monitoring and making sure that you've got that whole plant. Um, I also wanna mention that when we're talking about pulling things in riparian um, areas and along, you know, right along the stream, that can also cause its own kind of disturbance that people might not be aware of. Um, where if you're, you know, ripping out a large root mass of a honeysuckle, the, um, the disturbance to the bank and all the soil that might come off those roots and go into the stream might not be better um, than using a target, targeted herbicide and not having any of that disturbance to the, to the soil. Um, I linked, again, a, another QR code here to a YouTube video that the, um, the CISMA, the Southern, oh, I'm not good with acronyms and I forgot to write it down. It's the, um, the Southern, Kelly, do you know? <laughs> uh, Southern Wyndham, uh, I'm struggling here. Do you know CISMA? Are you thinking of the uh, um, 
Natural Resources Conservation District? Yes, thank you. They, okay. They have a, thank you. <laughs> they have a, um, a separate small coalition where they focus on invasive species with, there's some CISMA uh, acronym that it is. Right. Acronym. I'm sure but I can they, pull that up. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I should have written it down. No um, but it's a, the Southern, um, yeah, the, the Wyndham Conservation District, who is concerned about water quality in, um, you know, in the Wyndham County, they did this series of uh, invasive webinars where they had a lot of professionals um, kind of explain in one whole hour long um, webinar about non-chemical strategies and when those are appropriate. And then they also did another one on um, on chemical strategies. Yes, did you? Oh, um, I can send those I links. I can send those links to Sue. I'm sure I have them in my email. Great, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so again, I am happy to discuss in the in the questions, and I'm trying to move along so we can get to questions. Um, there's a lot to cover, and so for anybody that really is interested in these specific um, non-chemical strategies or chemical strategies. I link these um, these webinars that they did because, again, they're great. They had a whole panel of, of experts talking about them, um, and I wanted to provide those for anybody interested. So we'll move on to chemical strategies. Um, you know, best practice, I want to say, is to consult a licensed pesticide applicator in Vermont if you're applying um, herbicide. If you're applying it on your private property, you do not need to be licensed. But if you have any kind of project of scale or you are overwhelmed by the idea, I would say, please, please um, consult a licensed pesticide applicator. They really know what they're talking about. They have the on the ground experience to tell you, you know, what is gonna work and what won't work. So before you, you know, invest a lot of money in it, they will tell you, yes, this is going to be successful or no, probably isn't. Um, and then I said it before, but again, you know, an initial response using chemicals often leads to the possibility of using a mechanical or non-chemical strategy. And so something like in these pictures where there's large, large plants, which often grow, you know, again, on riparian areas, you often have a lot of sunlight reaching those plants and so they can get very big very fast um, and so knocking them back and then controlling with something like hand pulling or smothering um, is often much more successful and again here's a, the qr code and the link to um, the the webinar that they did and those are separate webinars I think. Um, and then i also want to address here there's a a common myth that you can't use herbicide around water. And the fact is that the label is the law on herbicides. And so some herbicides are formulated to be used around water. The, the herbicide um, cannot, you know, get into the water. You're not like putting it directly in the water, but to be used around the water along the stream banks um, that's often you know folks in waders and they're standing in the stream and then spraying up against um, the bank and it's um you know pretty pretty common to do there's also um there's also a um in vermont at least there's an allowed use in wetlands also to treat herbicide or to use herbicides to treat invasive because there's a recognition that the invasives there are causing um, such a, a damage to that ecosystem and can if left unchecked, that um, there's an agreement that using these water safe herbicides, um, a common one is, is rodeo, um, that those are you know, a safer option than just letting the invasives um, go wild in those areas. Kelly, did you have something? I think you're on mute. There we go. I was just typing to Sue that I just emailed her the link to the Wyndham County CISMA. That's their cooperative in 
the invasive species management area. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole series of, of webinars. So she's got the link now. She should be able to pop that in there. Um, and then Leslie had a question. Sorry to, so, so if I'm sidetracking you, um, that oh, there's a lot of spread by mowing roadsides when invasives have already gone to seed. Yeah. Uh, however, that can weaken the plant if it can be prevented from developing seed. And do you work with highway departments? And I know that's one of the reasons that I reached out to you. I keep wanting these invasive species management areas to include AOT for, for the state and the, um, you know, the, the municipal mowing, parks and rec mowing, everybody's mowing schedule. It, it has to fit their budget. It has to fit their, their employee timeline, but it would be great if we could somehow coordinate hitting these things once they put out a lot of effort, but before they've gone to seed. I don't know how that's possible, but do you do anything like that? Um, I am not directly involved in com those conversations. I do know that Elizabeth Spinney, who's the invasive plant coordinator for, for Forest Parks and Recreation, um, does have conversations. There's definitely, you know, it, we're very aware of the issue. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it has gone, you know, where that is actually, where those conversations have gone. Um, you know, I think talking to neighbors and people that you might have some uh, control over is very helpful. I know that, you know, with any FPR mowing, they're aware of invasive timing and, and, and a lot of times those areas are being hand pulled for the invasives, especially something like um, poison parsnip. There's a lot of hand pulling that occurs and then they, the, you know, whoever it is that's hired to do the mowing mows it after, once, once those areas have been hand pulled to remove poison parsnip. And then one other question that popped up um, was, does the state use Roundup? Yes, um, the state does use Roundup. Um, Roundup you know, uh, it has to be used again according to the the label. Um, the label is the law, but we have um, several licensed pesticide applicators. I'm a licensed pesticide applicator. Um, anybody that applies it is licensed, and um, we follow the label and use it effectively to control invasive populations. And anybody that's interested. Um, the Department of Ag, who oversees, you know, the pesticide uh, licensure, they have um, several documents that kind of explain the use of Roundup and what Roundup is, um, and you know where it falls on toxicity um, levels compared to things like table salt and coffee and other things. Um, you know, it I think that a lot of people are very nervous of herbicides. Um, I understand why. I am not saying we should spread them everywhere all the time, use them, you know, willy-nilly, but I feel very strongly that the impacts of invasive plants when they're left unchecked is, um, you know, can be worse than the, the issues that that people have with Roundup, the kind of like icky feeling that people get from using an herbicide or that the idea. Um, if you walk through the woods and start to really see some of the, the long-term environmental effects and ecosystem effects of invasives, I think that they, um, you know, it's the lesser of two evils and it's really scary what, what these plants can do and how they can change our ecosystems if we don't take notice and start to do something. And mechanical or uh, non-chemical methods of control are, are really just not an option in a lot of places where these have been left unchecked for the last 20 years and we have huge populations. And so um, I think that, you know, they need to be we need to choose which one we're, you know, willing to live with a one or two time herbicide treatment to get it knocked down to a point where we can monitor and manage by hand and do some pulling. Um, you know, I think that for me, that's what I, that's what I advocate for is, is control to a point where you can 
where we actually can step in and do hand pulling and things like that. But a lot of times there just isn't any option right when you're trying to tackle the problem. Yes. Do you promote the, um, the, the idea of the knocking back chemically enough so that we can then mechanically manage the invasive while also, do, do you consider putting uh, natives in place as you're working on the invasives so that it puts additional pressure on those invasives and eventually regrows that native um, army, if you will. Yeah, so you, uh, you're reading my mind. Uh, that's my next, I got two more slides and then I talk about planting native, native plants. So, um, you know, here's a site. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that you might feel overwhelmed and that we're talking about a lot of kind of overwhelming amounts of plants and you have to use herbicide to knock it back to a point but um you know starting rather than just burying your head in the sand um you know we want to acknowledge that you might have a very large problem on your property and it can feel really overwhelming once you're just kind of the blinders come off and you start to realize what you have um you know but there is there is funding assistance through nrcs um so there's you know, money in lots of different states, they will pay uh, landowners a portion to control the invasives. Um, you also might need to decide that you're gonna work on a certain area and tackle a certain area you might have, um, you know, you might have a stream and you know you have uh, knotweed on that stream and you wanna tackle the knotweed and then move on to something else. Um, and then you also, I want to, um, mentioned that there are a lot of neighborhood groups. I know, especially for things like, um, you know, along roads, I know several different groups that go do like um, walking groups and they pull um, chervil while they're, while they're walking or they pull, um, you know, I'm trying to think of another, a oh, garlic mustard is another one that's, um, you know, you can just kind of pull that as you're going and monitor it. Um, and so it can be a lot more fun when you're working with neighbors and you're, you know, working together to try and keep an area clear of invasives and keep them knocked back. Just pulling and bagging, don't just drop it on the ground though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. So pulling and bagging. Um, another, you know, another trick is to hang it in a tree, um, let it dry. So you might, especially for woody invasives, you can pull it on the road and you're hanging in a tree. Now your garlic mustard, just make sure it doesn't have seeds already because they'll continue to ripen and then yeah, they'll explode. We've just replanted a whole forest of, <laughs> of uh, garlic mustard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, it, it's a gray picture, but it's also for me, this means hope because, you know, this was knocked back. It is possible. This was done with an herbicide, but, you know, this was, you see all these gray plants in here and they were knocked back. They were treated with an herbicide and now they can you know brush hog that area and then um you know they might choose to expand their field a lot of times these encroach in from field edges again we're moving a little bit away from the riparian buffer area but um control across the landscape is good for everything and riparian buffers included so they might brush hog this or they might replant um, they also might just come in here and pull up anything that comes up and let this naturally regenerate. And so, you know, getting to the planting natives, you know, planting natives, especially along riparian buffers where, um, you know, they're sensitive and we really want to get something established there that's good and to fill that space. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of native plants that are really easy to plant on riparian buffers. You can take uh, pussy willow shoots or dogwood shoots and it's just a stem and you stick it in the ground in the spring and all of a sudden you have a new plant. And so that is a really great way to, um, you know, fill that space really quickly. A lot of those dogwoods, they will grow pretty rapidly and they're wonderful for birds. They have, you know, native, native berries and they will fill that space, but they've just been crowded out or they weren't there in enough 
quantity that an invasive came in, but if you can get them reestablished, they will take over and be really successful. The dog beds are, are used for stream bank stabilization too yes. a lot. Yep. They have a nice mesh of uh, of roots, unlike your knotweed, and they'll they'll really hold that soil in place. And they're very hardy. They'll they'll put up with uh, ice scouring. They'll put up with flooding. They'll put up with drought. They're they're yeah. pretty tough. Yep. And uh, yeah, even with some of that like ice scouring, they you know even if they get broken off, they'll you know shoot up vigorously and that. Now, we want that in native plants. We don't want that in invasive plants. So it's, you know, trying to trying to figure out which is the best, you know, we want, we want that to happen with native plants. And so we want to, you know, reintroduce those where they maybe have been crowded out. Um, you know, also planting native plants in your landscaping and gardening is really important because all of the invasives or almost all of the invasives that have spread into the forest and into riparian areas were originally in somebody's garden or planted as a hedge. Um, and so, you know, getting back to looking around us and, and planting what naturally occurs um, is a really great way, or at least even if it's not, you know, if it's not native, at least not planting invasives more. Um, and then, you know, there's also places where we can just encourage a larger population of native plants to grow. So a lot of mowed lawns, if we let those go to wildflowers, those wildflowers will continue to spread across our landscape. Um, and so just having more of the nat native natural seeds around is, is always beneficial. Um, and again, I want to um, put a, a plug in here. I have lots of lists of native plants. Um, and things that are great for pollinators and can be found in nurseries around the state. And I am happy to provide those for anybody. And also um, some of the uh, natural resources conservation districts, um, they do a spring plant sale. If you can watch, sign up for those, <laughs> jump on them. Um, they, they've got, uh, oh, you're, look at you, you're just going to yeah. do something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, sometimes sometimes that's buying in bulk gets you a better price. Um, and sometimes there are people who are looking to, to jump in on an order. Um, so I, I, I would be happy to talk to people who want to do some shopping like in the spring and they, you know, I, I can't afford, you know, 12 of these, but I can't afford five. Great. I need seven for a project that I'm planting. So by all means, give me a holler. Yep. Yeah. So bulk plantings and, you know, making sure that you're working with somebody that can check and make sure that the, um, you know, the species, the scientific name is actually for the native plant, not some weird variety that's coming from a nursery or something. And that's what the Natural Resource Conservation District really can, you know, focus on. And they have folks on staff that can make sure that what's being ordered is native and not, and not a weird variety. Um, and so finally, um, we get to questions. So I just wanted to say like it can invasives can be kind of overwhelming but I also think and know a lot of people that find it um, a very satisfying way to get to know your land a little bit more intimately and and get out there and have a project that you're really passionate about um, and <clears throat> excuse me so it gets you exploring your your property a little bit more or just the areas around you um, maybe you've always looked at a stream from a certain angle and if you're getting down there to try and get after some invasives, you might, might learn more about the stream. Um, we also aren't going to eradicate them all from the landscape, landscape um, you know, but, but also just saying, well, they're here and we can't do anything about them is irresponsible. We brought them here as humans. And so, you know, I, I think that if we are stewards of the land, we need to be responsible and, and trying to control them the best we can. Um, you know, healthy riparian buffers also protect human infrastructure. We need buffers and we need these floodplains to protect our downstreams and our rivers. We can't, you know, we can't and don't want to get rid of the rivers. Um, and so we need to allow them the space to act naturally. Um, and a lot of people also, you know, are planting natives. They're kind of like going, reverting back to these natives because they realize that um, a lot more pollinators show up in their gardens, wildlife and birds, 
things that they are interested in seeing, you can draw those right up to your front door if you plant, you know, plant things that they like and don't have to go searching for. So I will leave it here and take questions. At this point, you touched on a lot of things I was going to say, but it looks like Sue may have a question for you too. Sorry, uh, just you might want to stop sharing your screen at this point, and people sure. who have questions might want to unmute themselves and ask the questions, or you can put them in the chat. I think Hannah, one of the questions that you probably have addressed, but but maybe you need to address a little bit more was how to dispose of of the uh, invasives as you um, after you've pulled them or whatever and you know the whole thing. Sure. So um, if you are treating with an herbicide, then you don't need to do anything. You can let those. You know, you can. Um, burn that material, you can mow it. Sometimes that is best because then you can then monitor that area better. But if you are trying to leave a lot of native things, then just letting, you know, leaving it where, where it is, is, is ideal. For anything that you're hand pulling or cutting, um, if you are cutting anything or hand pulling anything with berries, you should be bagging that. Um, if, if not the whole plant, at least snipping off the berry portion or the seed stock or whatever that is, because a lot of those, you know, another, you know, tricky thing about invasives is they will continue to ripen. Those seeds will continue to ripen even after they're cut off their plant. Even when they seem really immature, they will continue to ripen and spread. Um, so bagging those, you know, in, um, a lot like the contractor bags work really well, something that's really thick. So it's not going to punch through the sides and letting it, um, you know, some, I've heard lots of different methods. Some people um, let it bake in the sun for a long time. And when it's completely soup, you can kind of pour it out. Um, but you want to wait, a, you know, a year at least. You really want it to be completely decomposed. Um, don't put it in your compost. Um, the yeah, especially like any green plant parts. Don't put those in your compost. They're just going to create a new plant um, or several. Um, you can also some people you know put it in a bag, tie it up, and then they when they have a burn pile that's really rip roaring that they were going to do anyways to burn like normal brush, they dump it onto the burn pile when it's hot. Um, you know, some people do that, they just throw it in their, their wood stove or something once they're like dried and, um, you know, you don't want to, you can't start a burn pile with a wet mucky pile of something like um, knotweed or, or garlic mustard, um, but you can oftentimes get it to go once the, the pile's already ignited. Um, is that covering it for you guys. I think that's the, you know, there are lots of creative ways that people have found, but, you know, if you think like, is this enough? Or maybe this is maybe not enough, you should probably go an extra level or, or ask somebody. And what is the best way to get rid of the knotweed? That seems to be the most concerning because <laughs> even from Connecticut, I, I always heard about the knotweed. Yeah. Um, so there are some, there has been some success with, um, smothering or putting down a very fine, like, um, mesh, like, a something you might put like a rodent to like protect a, something from rodents, like a, a mesh wire. You can lay that over the knotweed and it'll grow up and it girdles it as it grows and it will continue to grow itself uh, or like kill itself by trying to grow. Um, but I've also heard that, you know, if you don't get thick enough wire mesh, it will just bust the, the mesh or continue to grow. Um, 
there are some success stories with smothering with um, black plastic, but that's a you know five year endeavor and on a stream that's not going to work. Um, that's like if you have a patch on level ground that's you know I don't know less than a quarter acre, um, probably even less than that. You know, small patch you can you know put down some black plastic and smother it. Realistically, the way that you're going to get rid of it is with an herbicide treatment, um, and then monitoring it. And um, there is some success with you know direct injections into the stem but that's super painstaking if you're dealing with a large population um, and so it's a it's a foliar spray and uh you know there's a lot of success with that we're doing that one time can uh, in the fall will will kill that population and then you can replant in that area yep. um, i know one one thing we had tried on our river bank um, here in Springfield was going through and just cutting, cutting, cutting. And I was down below cutting and I had a kid up above me pulling everyone, taking everyone that I cut, not pulling, like taking it out of the ground, but getting a hold of each one that I cut. Cause if it drops in the water, believe it or not, it can dis it can lodge itself on a gravel bed and start rooting, right? Just from a cut, cut piece that big, as long as there's one joint, it'll start growing. Um, so we would take all of these pieces I had laid some sticks out, kind of like, you know, in the old days when you're doing cordwood, between two trees, so I had the sticks on the ground, and we just laid all the stalks in there um, so that they weren't touching the ground, and within a year, by the next spring, they had completely gone, they were totally brittle, and they were starting to compact on themselves and just um, shatter, basically, because the, the dried stalks are extremely brittle. So they essentially decompose right there on site and fed the soil. But you just gotta make sure they don't touch the soil because they will regrow from there. The um, the population that you left from where you cut that though, how did that respond? Um, it was happy that I had reinvigorated its roots and it decided it was gonna start a whole new batch. So guess who's starting from scratch this year? Because I didn't, I didn't suck it up for the five-year plan yeah. <laughs> of constant management. Yeah, it's um, yeah. So it will, it has a lot stored in those roots. And yeah. That's why you're, you know, that's why the mode of like getting, getting the the poison, the herbicide into the roots is is so successful compared yeah. to cutting it back. There was um some success I had heard of folks who had cut they cut the knotweed stalk just below the lowest little node um, so that what was left was basically a cup of the stalk and they dripped in maybe a teaspoon of the herbicide and just walked away from it um, and it and this was at the end of the the season all the flowers had gone the bees were already happy and had had done their thing so this was really mid to late fall after all the flowering was done and the plant as you had mentioned is trying to pull all its energy reserves into that root ball to store it for the winter while it's pulling reserves in it's also pulling the poison in um, and there, there has been some success from other folks with that as well I actually went to go see one site in the spring and there were just these little weak ugly little twisted stalks of baby baby knotweed trying to come up and they were they were very very sad, um, so that that did seem to knock it back considerably. And just the consistency, you know, every couple of weeks go out there and check it. If it's not too huge of a population, go go back and and cut and cut and collect, cut and collect. Just keep up the pressure and don't give in. Yeah. Um, I think one other person had a good question. <laughs> a, I don't know if there's a good answer to this one. What town in Windsor County needs the most help with controlling invasive species? Hmm. I don't think you could pick one because yeah. I think every, every town is impacted by a variety. And you, so. yeah, you know, there are, you find different invasives in different towns. Um, like it's interesting, you find a lot more um, burning bush in like Woodstock, that area. They must have planted a lot of burning bush in that area. Um, you know, you go to other towns and it's a lot more knotweed or something like that. So it is, it does vary across towns, which is interesting. Um, and there are some towns that, 
yeah, just have a lot more knotweed. As you get, you know, Bridgewater and Plymouth are cooler. Um, and, you know, as you get into kind of cooler climates, invasives aren't quite as much of a problem. You know, they still, they still are, but it's maybe not quite as, hasn't reached there quite as bad. I'm hoping to um, organize with the, the Springfield Trails and Rural Economy Advisory Committee in town. I'm hoping to organize with them um, another invasive plant pull in one of the town forests this spring. <laughs> God willing, and everybody has a little more time on their hands. Uh, but we'll, we'll get in there. And we, uh, last year, we worked a lot on uh, the Japanese barberry. That's the one that I thought of when you mentioned the, the tick problem, because yeah. they have all these tiny little thorns and you know it's a well-behaved plant on your on your front lawn where you you trim it every year but all those little berries get picked up by the birds the birds head off into the woods eat the berry deposit the seed and no one's there managing that population so our town forest has a, a nice um a nice population of japanese barberry uh, so we'll, we'll hopefully be able to pull pull to, pun intended pull together another um another invasive plant pull this spring that might be an opportunity for a weed walk with you as well. Sure, yeah. Okay. Other questions? I didn't see anything else in the chat. Okay. Well, I'm happy to answer emails too about specific questions or pictures of invasives if somebody doesn't know or can't find it on VP Invasives. Okay, I'm going to just share my screen just so that I can do a plug for other library programs. Um, oh, you're muted, Sue. <laughs> Sorry, we have, <laughs> thank you. We have uh, Red Sox Nation tomorrow. The presenter is quite animated. Um, uh, next week, we have a local author that is presenting her, her new book, uh, and it's based on taking a trip through the Yellowstone. Kelly is coming back with us for Wetlands Are, are Wonderful. Um, we have the Adult Craft coming up, uh, DIY, DIY String Eggs, and then Kelly will be back again with Learn to Write a Waterway Quest. I want to thank everybody for attending, especially to thank Hannah and, and Kelly for their um, very good knowledge to share. And I will be sending out one probably tomorrow, not tonight, um, the, the link to the video and what Kelly has sent me and, and Hannah sends me as well. Um, when I have everything pulled together, I'll be sending it out. Okay. Great. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Hannah. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Sue, for, for hosting us and walking us through the Zoomy parts. No problem. All right. All right. And Have thank you, everybody, for showing up. This was great. Take Hi, care. thank you. Very thank good you, night, you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, Hannah. Yes, thank you, Hannah. This was great. I appreciate you taking time away from your little one. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> thank you.